no objective uh, to institute this organization is uh, do a scientific exploration study research and conservation advocacy of all the systems all the subterranean systems and the related systems including including flora and fauna so with this idea uh, we started the organization and recently uh, we have uh, become uh, global partners to celebrate the international year of cave and cast with uh, uh, with international union of speleology and uh, we do different activities under celebration of uh, international year of cave and cast like we have launched a, a feature launching uh, uh, on a social uh, social handle social media where we feature different uh, people working in uh, in the caves and cave related systems in the country which we call troglodytes of uh, indian uh, speleo india so these are people working in india people working in uh, doing research in caves in india and another activity is we are preparing a lot of awareness materials like recently we have launched the speleo in uh, the speleological association of india stickers and uh, one may always have a question how the logo sticker logo of the organization can be awareness material but believe me when i started uh, uh, sending it to people and people started asking me what is speleology so that is a present situation in this country many people doesn't even know what is speleology so with this way we are actually awareing people what is speleology and what is the uh, this association is about and what is a cave research and conservation then uh, one of the activities we are also uh, conducting uh, organizing different webinars across the year uh, generally once in a month and like today we will be having one and uh, then what is geologist day like today we are celebrating geologist day what is geologist day it's, it's basically a, a a day when we celebrate a very underrated uh, 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 division of science which is geology geology very few people study geology and very few people are aware of this subject uh, it is basically a science that studies materials and natural features and processes on earth and uh, the geologist day was first celebrated in april 1969 and why it is celebrated it is celebrated on every first sunday of april month and why april month so this was started by the soviet uh, soviet uh, geologists and uh, april because uh, this is the time when the winter ends and spring begins so this is the time when geologists will start their work uh, that's why april and then i was looking for some information then i found uh, there is also uh, uh, information which talks about how to celebrate the geologist day so it's basically uh, learn more about geology it is about show approach appreciation to a geologists like we have our speaker today so uh, that is another way of doing it and listen to a geology theme play playlist there are there is an online playlist where there are a lot of uh, uh, tracks which uh, are related to geological themes and share geology day with the friends so these are the things we are trying to do through this uh, today's uh, uh, seminar today's webinar and uh, we have dr jayshree San sanwal with us who is a hardcore geologist and uh, we are very happy to say that she is a member of speleological association of india she is also uh, a woman scientist at at uh, uh, jncsr bangalore and uh, uh, to talk about uh, dr jayshree she has finished her uh, doctoral degree in 2003 from kumau university and she is a recipient of the dst women scientist award fellowship uh, and she, uh, currently she is working uh, at at the geodynamic unit of jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research in bangalore 
and her current research focuses on new exciting frontiers in geodynamics identifying the significant linkages between climate surface process and tectonics and she uses a geological proxies like natural carbonate caves and lake deposits to constrain spatial and temporal evolution of climate and tectonics and she also developed a new domain of speleology research that has link linkages with phase stability and mineral chemistry with uh, bearing on environmental and climate change science and nuclear energy related programs very difficult words to even say so i just read it uh, so with uh, all this i i request uh, dr jayshri to uh, I request Dr. Jayshri to please take over and uh, educate us something related to cave geology. And uh, I'm sure this uh, this session is going to be really interesting because many of us are not really aware of many things related to cave geology. So, Dr. Jayshri, uh, uh, to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sirish, for such a wonderful introduction, elaborative introduction. And I'm really happy that people from different sciences are gathered here to celebrate the geologist day. So on behalf of all the geologists, I would like to first uh, congratulate them or to wish them a happy geologist day. So uh, I will uh, not give a very technical presentation because I know there are people from different backgrounds. So I will try to make it a little bit more simpler so that people can have a you know flavor of geology and they can understand what exactly the geo geology you know is uh, hidden behind the caves. So uh, shall I start with my presentation? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. So uh, here I just entire screen. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So better I close my camera. So. One second, I think. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, the first slide, can you see? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, this. Uh... <clears throat> From the Earth's trust to its deep core, the fascination and curiosity to explore more begins the journey of a geologist. Geologist Day is celebrated every year on the first Sunday of April. It was first declared in 1966 by the USSR and eventually spread globally. On the occasion of Geologist Day, on behalf of Geological Community, I welcome you all to feel the flavor of geology with a geologist. Nature often surprises us by creating incredible secrets on the earth, hidden under the diverse landscape and environmental system. One such hidden environment on the earth is the cave, the dark continent or the lost world. Researchers from diverse fields have always been inquisitive to discover the signs behind case formation, their structures, geomorphology, and their potential. It is my immense pleasure to talk about such an incredible subject today. Let us begin with the introduction to a cave, which is a geological wonder. Caves are the natural underground voids extending beyond the zone of light caused extensively by diverse geological processes in various rocks and many ecosystems. Caves range in size from a simple room to interconnecting miles long passages. The scientific study of caves is called speleology, which is derived from the Greek word speleo for cave and logo stands for study. Speleology is a composite science based on hydrology, geology, biology and archaeology thus holds a particular interest of earth scientists 
The caves have been natural attractions from the primordial human who confined their dwellings within these hollow geological structures to the explorers and adventurers. The prolific evidence of early human attraction has been discovered in caves scattered worldwide. As you can see, the skeleton fragment of some earlier mankind creature, Australopithecine, has been discovered in cave deposits from South Africa. The first evidence of primitive Neanderthal was also discovered from a cave in the Neander Valley of Germany. This is a female Homo neanderthalensis skull discovered at Tabun Cave at Mount Carmel in Israel. This Neanderthal specimen is dated back to around 130,000 years before present. Not only that, the cro magnon well-known population of early Homo sapiens from the Upper Paleolithic period approximately around 40,000 to 10,000 years ago, in Europe created their remarkable murals on the cave walls in southern France and northern Spain, where they took refuge uh, for more than 10,000 years ago during the chilling ice age, which is well known uh, geologically as last glacial maxima or LGM. This is the latest archaeological discovery you can see in this picture. Now let's go to the next slide to understand the type of caves. The most common caves are solution or karst cave, lava cave, sea caves, glacial or ice caves, talus caves, regolithic caves, and wind caves. Caves are the geological thrills, a treasure in the Earth's belly. In the next couple of slides, I will show you some of the selected caves type and their relative formation processes in glands. I begin with lava caves. As we all know, the molten rocks or magma oozes onto the Earth's surface is known as lava. Lava cave forms when the outer surface of a lava flow cools down and solidifies while the molten lava inside persists to flow and eventually drains out through the newly formed tubes. Some such lava tubes and channels forming lava distributaries have been documented from different parts of Western Deccan Volcanic Province in India by Pavar et al. 2016. This small lava cave in this picture you can see is exposed at uh, Ghoradeshwar Hill near Pune. Now, in this picture, you can see the entrance of lava cave in Big Island, Hawaii. The stone lava tube in Hawaii Volcanic National Park is an excellent example of a lava cave. Well, you can see in these pictures, these are the tubular lava stalactites and lava helixites, which are the minerals inside the lava caves. This particular picture shows the lava sickles on the ceiling of a cave in Lava Beds National Monument to USA. The rare characteristics of lava tubes are lava pillars. This is a lava pillar located in the lava tubes in Korea. It's uh, known as uh, Manjangul lava pillar. Now comes sea or coastal caves. All these pictures on the screen show the number of examples of such caves. These caves are carved through erosion, usually in the weaker zones such as faults and fractured areas. Such caves are the result of a wave's enormous pressure and the corrosive power of sand and gravel. These caves begin as a very narrow crack into which waves can penetrate and exert tremendous forces cracking the rocks from within by the weight of the water and air compression. Among all the worldwide caves, the sea caves, those located between high cliffs where seawater is devoured up and mixed in the rock formations, appear as one of the most beautiful caves. Exploring the sea and underwater caves is one of the most exciting subjects for cavers. We are fortunate enough to have Mr. Vishwanath Rajan as an expert cave diver and a precious member of Speleological Association of India. His deeply involved thoughts and extensive experience carry us to the depth of the underwater world of the fairy tales. Now comes the glacial caves, formed by meltwater, excavating drainage tunnels through the ice of an entirely different origin and not to be included in the category of glaciers cave are so-called ice caves which usually are either solution cave or lava cave within which ice forms and persists through all or most of the year. We have an excellent example of uh, such caves in Amarnath, situated in Jammu and Kashmir. Here are some more examples of glaciers cave in different parts of the world. 
The openings formed between boulders piled up on mountain slopes are called talus caves. They are predominantly minimal in size. However, some boulders piles have explorable interconnected passages or considerable length. The most famous Deenbedkar rock shelter and archaeological site located in Madhya Pradesh is an example of such formation. If we see in the desert area, some shallow caves formed by the sand blasting effect of silt or fine sand being blown against the rock face. These evening caves, some of which are spectacular in size. Uh, for, for example, Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota is an excellent example of wind caves. And they are named for the strong air currents that ultimately blow in and out of the cave as the atmospheric pressure changes. Now comes the solution caves. The solution caves are formed in carbonate and sulfate rocks such as limestone, dolomite, marbles, and gypsum by the action of slowly moving underground water that dissolves the rocks to form tunnels, irregular passages, and even large caverns along joints and bedding planes. Solution caves are commonly referred to as limestone caves. Most of the world's largest caves are of this type. The concept of karst is closely related to the landscape that forms inside the limestone caves. So far, the focus of my research also remains on limestone caves. The story of limestone begins hundreds of millions of years ago when sea covered most of the continents. As we know, all different plants and animals make their shell by extracting calcium carbonate from seawater. Collectively, their remains got deposited on the seafloor and eventually turns into limestone, our carbonate rocks. Solution caves have always been a source of wonder. How do these extensively complex and beautifully decorated passageways develop? These questions come in our mind when we visit such caves. Basically, the solution cave forms in limestone rock, as stated earlier, by the action of water. Calcium carbonate, the main mineral of limestone, is barely soluble in pure water. As we know, earth and soil is usually rich in carbon dioxide gas produced by biological activities. During the rainfall, the meteoric water absorbs some carbon dioxide as it passes through the atmosphere and even more as it percolates through the soil into the ground, picks up the carbon dioxide from humic and fulvic acid. The water combined chemically with the carbon dioxide Look at this cartoon. Look at this cartoon. This simplifies how the carbon dioxide enriched water in the unsaturated zone dissolves calcite as it trickles down through the limestone above the cave. The carbon dioxide gas escapes from the water, uh, just like as it escapes from the open bottle of soda pop. The acidity of the water is thereby reduced. Now, the calcium bicarbonate cannot remain in solution the calcite is then deposited as a dripstone. Now comes to the cave structure. All the structure forms inside the caves are collectively known as paleothem. The most common paleothems are stalagmites, stalactites, flowstone, and cave curtains. Not only that, but some delicious names are also given to the cave structures like cave bacon and cave popcorns. Caves are also well known for their fragile ecosystem and diverse biology. I will not touch upon this subject as it is too vast to discuss. Moreover, we have Dr. Siddish, Danusha, and their team as subject expert, the founder member of Speleological Association of India. Now, let us see the different formation of speleothems in limestone caves and the science behind them. I start with the role of water droplets trickling through cracks in the cave ceiling into a limestone cave and leaves calcite forming thin hollow tubes known as stalactites. They hang down. Now comes the stalagmites, which grow upward from the cave floor, generally as a result of water dripping from overhanging stalactites. 
Each successive drop of water from stalactites or soda straw hanging from cave ceilings adds a thin layer of minerals to the growing stalagmite on the cave floor. The latest research by Justin Thomertier et al. 2019, published in Proceeding of a Royal Society, sheds some light on the diverse shape of stalagmites. This study illustrated a physical based model showing that stalagmite forms depend on the distance of the water droplets falling from their stalactite of origin. Their work is based upon multiple photographs and recorded frames of 65 stalagmites. The water droplets falling at stalagmite found that the size of the falling droplets were remarkably similar. As you can see in this high speed video, the droplet create a splash when they impact a stalagmite. The water droplets do not fall in the same place each time. Instead, successive droplets were dispersed by a few inches each time they struck stalagmite. They calculated that the water droplets falling from long distance would be jostled enough to be displaced by up of a few uh, inches. Droplets falling less than a few feet, on the other hand, would meander very less because they do not build up as much as speed as they fall for the shorter <clears throat> time. This link between stalagmite, shape, and droplets fall distance can be used to reconstruct how a cave's height has changed over time. See this cartoon and the vertical section of Hollis to stalagmite explain how the vertical growth bands develop each year in stalagmite and expanded laterally in stalactite. The column. The column forms when the stalactite and stalactite grows until they join together. Column can be found uh, wherever stalactite and stalagmites grow, but they are less common because it takes a very long time for, for, for this formation to meet and grow together. Sometimes they have been joined for so long that it is hard to tell whether they are the separate formations or just the one. Now comes the flowstone. The flowstone forms by the running water over carbonate rocks. Flowstone looks like the rock that has flown down like a liquid and is often described as a frozen waterfall. It can be pure white or reddish brown depending upon the mineral. Draperies or cave curtains can be found hanging out from walls down from ceilings or off the bottom of flowstone formations. They look like delicately draped and folded fabric. They form when water flows down the limestone wall depositing calcite into draperies. Draperies that have mineral stripes are known as cave bacons. When minerals like iron oxides make stripes in the drapery, it is called a cave bacon stripe. Cave bacons can be found hanging out from the wall, down from the ceiling, or at the bottom of flowstone formations. Cave bacons are not as common as cave draperies. The tiny, knobby growth of calcites on the cave walls resembling popcorns are called cave popcorns or coral. They are considered a subcategory of a more diverse type of speleothems called a coralloids. They have concentric rings formed similar to drip, drip, uh, drop stones, but they grow in all directions, ignoring the gravity. Now let's have a quick look on the mineral depositions inside the caves. The caves provide a void space in the earth that proves an ideal environment for certain type of low temperature mineral deposition. These are some most common minerals one can find inside the cave. This is a picture of first work, a needle like aragonite crystal resembling frost. And this is a gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. You can see the curling growth of gypsum flowers. Isn't it beautiful? In some caves, we can see extensive needles known as enthodites. Now comes helictite, are curious twisted or spiraling cylindrical or needles. They apparently develop when the water seeps through the ceiling so slow that slight chemical or physical changes can cause reorientation of the calcite crystal structures. In other caves, selenite, a less commonly variety of gypsum, forms long transparent rods or nests of fibrous crystals. 
iron minerals in the form of oxides, uh, which is called limonite, and hydrooxides, uh, which is called geothite, occurs in cave. It is another extensive field to explore in the hidden depth. The caves are natural underground laboratories for researchers. The oxygen isotope record of speleothem provide vital information about variations in precipitation, temperature, and atmospheric circulation over low and mid-latitude regions. It is something too obvious uh, to mention that robust chronologies are necessary for the correct interpretation of climatic record. And due to their absolute chronological control, Speleothems are extensively used as a proxy to reconstruct past climatic and the mega event of active tectonics. Speleothems have gained the substantial interest of researchers due to their ability of uranium series dating. This concept is based on the water percolating into the cave containing trace amount of radioactive uranium, which gradually decays into thorium. Since thorium is insoluble in water, any thorium in the speleothem can only have emerged from the radioactive decay of uranium. And based on their half-lives, we can use the uranium-thorium ratio in the speleothem to accurately date them back to several thousand years. But sometimes the speleothems are not datable using this technique due to low concentration of uranium and sometimes high detrital thorium concentration. Radiocarbon method offers an alternative method of dating these speleothems, but these issues are associated with a dead carbon fraction, which have historically hindered this particular approach of dating the speleothems. As we know, the climatic change is considered one of the most challenging concerns. Understanding the past climatic pattern is crucial to simulate the future climatic trend. As the stated earlier, speleothems are one of the most potential proxy to reconstruct past climate pattern even though they grow only a few inches each year. They serve a record keepers of past environment and hydroclimatic conditions. Now, if you look into this graph, it shows multiple climatic variations in the last 1,800 years captured using oxygen-18 and carbon-13 isotopic analysis of a speleothem from central Himalaya. See this graph closely. You can prominently make out the multiple fluctuations in the isotopic ratio, including a few prominent climatic events like Little Ice Age and Medieval Warm Period took place during this particular time. The oxygen isotope value of the precipitation is resolute by the atmospheric circulation, the trajectory of the precipitation. The carbon isotope values of speleothem carbonate are locally controlled by biogenic soil productivity associated with the vegetation type and their density, which regulates the soil carbon dioxide content. Apart from this, we can also establish the history of large earthquakes by dating the growth perturbations and broken speleothems. This figure demonstrates the evidence of large older earthquakes in central Himalaya. As you can see in these pictures, these are the post-seismic regrowth, collapsed ceiling, speleothems, debris, etc triggered by multiple events of significant earthquakes. What we have done, we have dated some distorted speleothem to estimate the age of some older earthquakes. By now, you know how important the caves are for researchers from different fields. They are the homes of an amazing diversity of animals. The carcetic limestone strata are among the most productive aquifers, water-bearing beds, and are important water resources. Caves are important sources of nitrates. Though the nitrate salt are not clearly understood, they are believed to result from the action of nitrifying bacteria on organic matter or humus. Uh, caves have also been a source of bad guano, a material mined uh, for phosphatic fertilizers. Some large caves are also used as natural tunnels. After knowing the potentials of caves, don't you think that the conservation of caves is the most significant things we can ever do? This is my humble appeal to cave visitors on behalf of the Speleological Society of India. Please be careful when you visit any cave. Think before damaging any structures or rocks, you will be causing permanent damage to the cave system. Explore the cave and feel the thrills. Caves are home, habitat, and heaven for the surprising abundance of fragile resources. Resources found within composed a subterranean bird of fragile life, rare habitats, and exceptional speleothems. 
Many cave species have interesting adaptation for living in complete darkness, so do not disturb them. These underground environments serve as archival values protecting natural and uh, cultural history. Some human activities threaten cave life, causing multiple stress to the cave environment, habitat loss, decline in flora and fauna population, or sometimes even their extinction. So please avoid making unnecessary impact and join us in discovering new ways to conserve this natural heritage. So at the end, I would uh, only now, at the end before completing my talk, I would like to add on a few lines. Experience the thrill without destroying anything. Protect the harmony and beauty of the caves. Leave nothing behind except your footprints and avoid making unnecessary impact to this fragile ecosystem. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope uh, you like the presentation and uh, I did not bore you so much with a lot of geological explanations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jayshree. Wonderful presentation. Thanks a lot. A lot of information. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was a yeah. little bit more worried about the time because I know that everybody might be in hurry because it's a Sunday. So, uh, you know, I just try to finish it within uh, a given time. <laughs> So if there are any, yeah. yeah, I think now we can take up the questions. Yeah. Uh, so the participants can either type the questions in a chat box or they can directly ask. Uh, so till now, I don't think we have any questions in the chat box. So if anybody wants to directly ask questions to Dr. Jayshree, they can please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, yeah Janvi. Yes, my name is Janvi. Yeah, I'm a MSc student from Karnataka, India. So my question is... Yes, Janvi, yes. Ma'am, you said certain activities of humans cause damage to the case. Uh, could you explain what activity, activities are those which really damages the case? Well, if I can hear you properly, I think you are asking about the slide where I have shown the multiple damages to the cave due to the earthquake, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what happens in the cave when you have a larger size earthquake? So the cave, of course, uh, you know, during the earthquake, the earth shakes uh, both ways. Like it shakes this way and sometimes vertically and horizontally both. So the, as I told you, the caves, which are the Fazai ecosystem. And if you remember the slide of, uh, where I have explained the stalactites, which are the very hollow, very Fazai tubes. So during the process of earthquakes, these sometimes these stalactites, they break and come down and forms as a debris, you know, inside the cave. And even the, sometimes the cave uh, ceiling also get collapsed and the speleothems, the bigger speleothems also breaks up and the after uh, like the after the earthquake or we can say even post seismic activity what happens the new stalagmite grow on the older stalagmite so what you have you have the older stalagmite and the new starts growing up so what we do we usually we date them by using uranium thorium technique if you remember my slide where i have explained about the uranium thorium activity uh, uranium thorium chronology so we date them and see what was what was the time so we don't use just one sample to date the older earthquake we have to do it in a multiple cave and of course with the multiple samples so we know what was exactly the time when this particular earthquake have triggered you know and triggered these kind of damage to the cave yeah can uh, mama am I, mama yes? i asked about human activities you i i and think yes, you yes, spoke yes, about yes. natural damage see uh, in of course uh, as i told you people go to the cave and they do uh, they damage the cave sometimes they break the stalagmites and sometimes they you know they even scratches 
so we have to find out whether this particular damage has been caused by the human or by the natural activity so there are few parameters which uh, on the basis of that we can make out whether this particular damage were done naturally or by the human activities yes ma'am thank you thank you so much uh madam yes please i am sangeeta here uh, yes. is uh, remote sensing uh, anywhere helpful for uh, this kind of a research well remote sensing sometimes we can make out uh, the uh, you know the cave locations but uh, with the help of uh, satellite imagery i don't think so you can go because they are the deep uh, hidden uh, formations inside the you know depth of earth as we say so in the inside it is little bit more difficult to find out with a satellite image but of course uh, when we have to see the continent what kind of morphology geomorphology is there so on the basis some idea can be, can be taken and especially in the uh, you know uh, limestone terrain especially in the limestone terrain thank you ma'am thank you yeah 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 sir uh ma'am thank you very much mm -hmm. very nice presentation uh, this is dr harun from our sciences department university of sargodha pakistan uh, ma'am i want to ask uh, the difference between uh, epicast and cast in one of your slide you mention about epicast so is it a special type of cast or is it uh, every cast can be epicast thank well, you yeah uh, yeah thank you so much it's a very interesting question when we talk about the epicast and cast formations cast mostly they form inside the limestone you know when you have the carbonic rock as i told you they are the solution cavity others than that can be epicrust so when you have the cave cavities inside uh, the uh, you know the sandstone as i showed you sandstone cave regoliths cave and all these things comes under epi, uh, you know epi epicrust but most of the time only the limestone cave where you have the carbonate and the carving kind of structures it comes under uh under this category when you have dolomite when you have uh, these uh, marble and uh, calcite uh, basically thank you welcome she is you are on mute any more questions from any participant uh, i think there is a question in a chat box uh, bharat k uh, yeah, could, you, a, could you yeah, please share your experiences as a, as a geologist and the impact of on caves due to environmental pollution and climate change well the first question what i i see here is thank you for a wonderful presentation ma'am have you ever used ground penetration radar for uh, further study crash structures no so far we have not used any gpr study so mostly we use the physical studies we go to the we go to the you know sites and uh, find out the cave by ourselves and some uh, based on some uh, you know some kind of information we do so far we have not done uh, any such things and uh, then i any specific know, reason any specific reason madam for not using gpr well uh, so far uh, see i i'm a field geologist as i told you and uh, most of the time i as a geologist i hit the terrain where you have limestone cave and the water where you have lot of possibilities of having the caves so this is what one of the reasons so you know geologists are more inquisitive to go by themselves and find out the caves but uh, yes it's a good uh, maybe it's a, it's it's a good approach to use um, gpr studies to find out the cast structures because anyway they are the hollow structures and it is easy to find them out with such kind of mm -hmm. techniques yes absolutely uh, the next question uh next was from bharat k right uh, could uh, you please share your experiences oh well as, uh, a, ge as a geologist 
and the impacts on the cave due to environmental pollution and climate change yes 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 okay could you please share your experience as a geologist and the impact of cave due to environmental pollution and climate change yes absolutely the environmental pollution of course is a big threat see when we talk about the climate change it's a vast field and it is like natural as well as anthropogenic so when we talk about the longer cycles you know in hundreds of year cycle which uh, depends on the melanchobit cycle the sun cycle and the natural climatic we cannot change them because they are the cycle which cannot be changed but yes the anthropogenic changes uh, anthro due to the anthropogenic activities the changes we are bringing to the climate they are the short changes in the climate that are in our hand we can of course modify them and when you talk about the environmental pollution i will tell you a very good um, uh you know it's a kind of uh, some my my experience so when i was working in himalaya uh, in 2013 so we were going to certain caves uh, most of the time we we try to find the caves which are very deep and uh, you know not very close to the and we see the deposits which are not very close to the passage and these caves are mostly far off from the area you know the towns and uh, cities so that we don't see much effect but when i was uh, traveling on the road side and we try to collect some samples from the exposed uh, there are some export features also these cave like features so we took the sample and very interestingly we found so many black layers and we did the experiment on those black layers and they are happen to be heavy metals uh, we we got the zinc mercury and uh, some kind of a cause co2 was trapped inside so of course the environmental pollution is very harmful for the cave and it is of course a hazard for uh, all these natural caves including the fragile ecosystem inside the cave as i said oh thank you i hope i'm um, clear sorry uh, there is another question uh, do you think uh, uh, sar remote sensing is helpful for studying cave geology as plx bands of microwave has ability to penetrate can you share your ideas about yes of course as i said so far i have not used this study but of course these kind of studies are very useful because we know where the terrains are as i said if we can locate the you know the limestone terrain on the base based on the your remote sensing uh, tools or remote sensing images so it is a good study to see what exactly Uh, you know where we can find the caves of course we cannot do this kind of study what i am involved with for that we have to go ourselves physically and see the kind of structures we have to study them but yes to have an idea where these caves can be found and where these the presence of these caves can be identify these kind of techniques yes of course yes so these kind of study might be helpful for cave researchers Thank you, Aditya. Anybody else? Any more questions? I think Mr. Syed has raised his hand again. Uh, Mr. Syed, you can please go ahead to ask your question. Mr. Syed Harun Ali. yeah uh, sir i i guess i already have asked the question so but if there is an opportunity i want yeah, to sure. ask how to normally sample the stalagmites you show one slide in which there is samples from stalagmite or maybe stalactite but that is very high resolution how is normally the sampling procedure uh, that will be very helpful for us Uh, yes see uh, as i told you we have to be very careful even as a geologist we go or as a researcher we go and take the sample so we have to be very selective to break any kind of stalagmite or any formation in the cave for this research it is important for us to you know to take back the sample so what we do we try to cut the sample from their roots so that we can have a longer sequence so uh, longer the Uh, most of the time this is this is what i have seen in himalayan caves longer the length and we go back to the chronology they are much more older in the age so this is how we categorize the stalagmite to sample them and once we bring the sample and we slice them into two halves so one half we we do very high resolution data because as uh, if you remember the slide which i showed it has an annual and decadal scale laminations 
So each lamination, we have to drill to find out what, how the climate has changed in the past. So that is, of course, a very high resolution studies and very tricky also. And since we cannot waste many speleothem from one cave, so they are very precious for us. Even one single specimen is very precious to us. So we have to be very, very careful when we are sampling, even when we are resampling them or the micro sampling them inside the, our laboratories. Okay, yeah. thank you, ma'am. <laughs> You're most welcome. I see one more hand here. Yes. Madam, uh, uh, unmute, uh, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Sorry, sir. Yes. Yes. Sorry, yes. Sir, uh, I, I think I think can we go one by one? Uh, who will be asking first? Okay, sir, uh, Sangeeta, madam, you were asking. Yeah, please. Uh, any idea of what is the kind of flora and fauna uh, kind of correlated with such kind of uh, limestone? Well, Dr. Sirish is the best person to ask this question because I don't work on ecology, even in biological things, ecosystems. So he's the best person to ask. And I also always, you know, <laughs> get fascinated to see his answers. Uh, uh, maybe uh, like there are very different kind of fauna and flora living inside the caves, but especially in limestone caves where you get very high humidity and uh, also water inside these caves, uh, most of the time you get very unique uh, fauna and mostly the cave fauna is as known worldwide, is mostly dominated by crickets and spiders. Hmm. So yeah, we are going to have many more sessions related to the biology inside the caves and all. So definitely in some of our few next uh, sessions of webinars, you will get a lot of idea about the biology also. Uh, we are also planning some of the biodiversity related uh, webinars where you get a detailed information of it. So we may discuss it that time. You will be informed about the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I think Speleology India uh, wanted to ask something. Yes, yes, yes. Hi. Hi. Hello. I wanted to ask if there is a document where we can follow the regulations of doing ethical sampling or ethical tourism in caves. Caves. Yes, absolutely. So this is what I say, you know, we need to have some kind of rules and uh, some kind of public awareness, including the sci scientists, you know, just not the public. Even many a times I have seen scientists going to the cave and just simply destroying it, taking the samples back to their lab, even if they use them or not, but they want to have the samples. So I think there should be some kind of uh, strict rules to follow that uh, one should not be allowed to take as many samples as they want, of course, you know, because they are precious. So there should be some kind of uh, this strict rules so that people follow it up. And uh, as I say, is that public awareness is very important because these most of the, uh, if you, uh, my experience is mostly in the Himalayan caves. So most of the time, these caves are attraction for tourists. And especially as, uh, you know, when you, uh, they go uh, as a, they are the pilgrimage sites. So you have a lot of um, formations. And many times I have seen people breaking them up and they take them to their home, start spraying them, which is absolutely, there is no need of doing such things because they are the geological formation. They are, there is a science behind. So people should be, uh, you know, we should, uh, we should educate them about this thing first. So these kind of things are very important and not much awareness has been given to the public and even the scientists so far so that they don't destroy the environment inside the cave. So I think these kind of programs we must start as, as a part of even our uh, society's Teleological Association of India. Madam, I would be...
Yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Sain Gupta, as you write that, I agree there should be guidelines. I have seen completely destroyed caves. Some have been thrown away here and there. Yes, absolutely, you are right. A similar kind of thing I have seen in one cave, which was a very beautiful cave, though it didn't have many structures like spelio things, but they have a lot of other structures. And those caves are good aquifers. You know, you had a lot of water. So the villagers were using them for drinking water purposes, these caves. And they started, uh, you know, eroding the material. They started breaking the rocks and they used to throw them out so that they can have more water. So that's what I said. There is a need. There is a actually urgent need of educating them. They should not destroy such things. So you are right, absolutely right. Okay, okay, Sengupta, uh, Dipambita. Okay, I got it. It's good that keep it up. All the best for your PhD. Uh, so hi, uh, I think Jayshree Shrisar's uh, internet is a little fluctuating. Yeah, sir, are you back? I'm just back. I'm, just back. Yeah. I'm sorry. I had no, some network yeah. issues. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just telling that uh, we have already initiated such efforts. So right now, uh, uh, Ms. Dhanusha, one of the directors, it has started uh, educating educating uh, the college uh, students and the school students in Maharashtra. And definitely, like, uh, uh, we all should come together and do it across the country, yes, as you were suggesting. But definitely, we'll start our efforts with the full swing as early as possible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes anybody else? The, the, did yes. some campaigning uh, last. I went, in, uh, during the winters, I had gone to a couple of caves this time. So I also did some kind of campaigning, you know, to educate the villagers exactly, you know, how it's, they are the value. They are the priceless things for them. So I try to tell them that do not do this, that, but I don't know how far they follow now, but uh, I hope a little bit now they know about the science behind Spheliothem. So let's see great, great. if they conserve their caves, surroundings. Uh, any more questions? Uh, hi, good evening. I'm Shraddha. Yes, Shraddha. Yeah, I'm uh, working on bats, uh, uh, so micro bats, especially uh, cave uh, dwelling bats. So uh, how can I study the temperature and this, uh, you know, all other uh, physical parameters of caves when we can't enter inside? Like we can crawl and uh, there are there will be some spaces even we can't even crawl and only we can put the torch and see some places so how can i study those dimensions or even the other physical parameters like temperature humidity or light yeah you want to know the current humidity temperature and other parameters yeah. right yeah. so there are some loggers there are some loggers which you can buy you know, they are not very expensive loggers. You can keep mm -hmm. them into the lab, uh, into the cave. Uh, for example, if you are working in a cave for one one week, for example, or three days. So just keep the loggers somewhere safe inside the caves. You have small cavities. You know, there are few uh, certain rooms inside the caves. So hide them somewhere. So most of the time, all the places uh, and make sure that you are putting your loggers deep into the cave, just not at the passage. Because there are a lot of, uh, you know, atmospheric disturbance if you go mm -hmm. towards the passage. But of course, if you go towards the deeper part of the cave, you will mm -hmm. definitely get the overall, uh, overall, uh, you know, the kind of humidity you are looking for. Okay. Ma'am, I have one more small question. Uh, so uh, when we were uh, exploring caves, uh, one at one place, one not only one place at the this laterite caves, uh, they are not. Uh, I don't think they are uh, natural. They dig. Uh, so in our place, uh, this Western Ghats is coastal region. We have tunnel. Okay. So people uh, dig this uh, tunnel to uh, you know uh, uh, to harvest water. Okay, so uh, here also we, ha we have seen a few crabs and even some other uh, you know, spiders and all, and other arthropods also. Uh, so does that uh, you know uh, make any difference in the cave structure? Like these crabs, 
uh, as we have seen they dig some small small holes so does that make any uh, Yes, they do. Yeah, structural. If you just if you ask about the structural, yes, they do. Because what they do, they make smaller holes, like yeah. you know. And later on, the sand fills in these kind of structures. So, for example, mm. if you have uh, clay, so in clay, mm. they make some kind of passages where later mm. on the material, like silty material or the sand, get deposited when the wind okay. comes or even the sea waves comes in. So, of course, they do. They make some kind of secondary structures. they do okay. this these kind of things but uh, it's not a major change but of course it's a morphological changes in these kind mm -hmm. of meteorite structures yes yes absolutely okay and yeah in that lateral uh, caves uh, those walls uh, were like uh, majority it was red but uh, yeah few white white color patches were there and i don't know whether it is purely fungal or any other uh, it could be some mineralization also because laterite has bauxite minerals so it could be some form of uh, such kind of mineral so you may have to scrap it and see whether it has some kind of mineral what kind of mineral composition you have in those particular patches so like mm -hmm. you know that that way you will be able to know what exactly those patches are and sometimes due to the humidity because as you say they are the coastal caves so mm -hmm. maybe due to the humidity you may have some kind of fungus growth inside and they turn white in color so biological activities also produces some kind of structures yes okay thank you so much ma'am you're most welcome thank you yeah there is another question i can see here ma'am could you please tell us something about the meghalayan age which was yes 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 so if we talk about the meghalayan age now we are in new era of uh, the you know the holocene period so this meghalaya age also was it is basically meghalaya is age was given the name after the meghalayan cave as you know by from the speleothem studies and this is a event which has happened in 4.1 4.1 uh, or 4100 years before present when there was a lot of uh, the monsoons were declined so it was a kind of dry phase when lot of civilization collapsed so it becomes a very you know a prominent phase of climatic changes uh, change during that time which is also known as 4.2 mega event of dry period so on the so based on that particular dry period and collapse of lot of civilization just not in india there were lot of civilization in china mediterranean and other region in western side also where uh, this civilization got collapsed uh, due to the um, decline declination of indian summer monsoon so that's why this meghalayan age was given based on that particular event which was 4.2 mega event of drier period since the sample comes from meghalaya meghalayan cave so that's why the name was given as meghalayan age so as a geologist if you see the you know the youngest period youngest period is known as uh, quaternary period after that you have uh, the latest recent period many people also call it as anthropocene because we this is the era which is known as anthropocene so there is a lot of debate still going on whether it is a though it is you know well accepted that meghalayan age but still there are a lot of um, hue and cry about whether it is a meghalayan age or it is uh, really an anthropocene is an epoch or a era so these kind of debates are still going on but this particular meghalayan age is named after the Yeah, speleothem collected from Meghalaya, which shows the drier period, four point two years before present, two thousand four thousand two hundred years before present. Well, can you also predict future climatic change using caves? Well, see, uh, to predict or to simulate any kind of climatic uh, events, as I said earlier, we need to have a lot of data. Yes, people do. people do it because uh, using speleothems and tree rings because they can be sampled in a very close interval with a high resolution so there are chances that if we make a perfect uh, graph for last 100 years or 1000 years that how the climate has changes in each year for 1000 years and just not based on one specimen we have to have a multiple specimen 
from regionally, you know, just not locally. So if we have the regional climatic data for the last thousand years, then of course there are possibilities and there are models which people run and simulate uh, and predict the future climate. But it needs a lot and lot of data. Got it, Jaisri. Thank you. I, I just asked the question out of curiosity. And I also want to know that, you know, uh, what, what is the kind of error or what is the probability? Like every model will have some or, some or the other error. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. then how do we go ahead with that? Yeah, of course. Even if you see the, uh, the reconstruction, when we reconstruct the paleoclimatic changes using speleothem or any other proxy, so there are uncertainty in the ages, which uh, starts from 60 years to 10 years. Sometime it goes to 90 years, 200 years. So within that uncertainty, if you are making a model, which is model, which is based on that kind of uncertainty, so definitely you are going to have you know, some kind of uncertainty in the model itself. So it depends what kind of data, the quality of data and the quantity of data, because you need quantity of data to predict the climate. So there is, of course, uh, errors and uncertainty in such kind of models. Yeah, but it will be really interesting to know, you know, if we can, uh, if we can predict earthquakes or we can predict tsunamis and, you know, using caves. Yeah. So yeah, it yeah. will be uh, very interesting. And it will really help mankind like on a very large scale. Yeah, so, and uh, see smaller. It's not equal. Yeah, we can we can do. There are models which people use it based on the paleo climatic data or you know paleo earthquake data. So there are some models which people use, but. Uh, See, we cannot predict the year, like we cannot say that it is going to happen in next year. Of course, we can give a time frame of about 10 years that it might happen within these kind of because uh, because of the error. So, of course, these kind of models are available. People are working on such kind of models where you have, of course, the error. But yes, there are uh, data available and it is possible to make such kind of predictions based on the, you know, the Earthquakes, past earthquakes, past climate, past tsunami. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Jasti, thank you. Thank you so much for answering. Thank you. Oh. So everything has a cyclicity. As yeah, I am back. Future. So it depends on the cycle, what kind of cycle, yeah. what is the period, you know, the cycle is repeating. So based right. on that, they make the models. So any more questions? Yeah, thank, thank you again. Uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, I would like to thank Dr. Jaisri and uh, I would like to especially thank uh, uh, some of the eminent uh, people attending this uh, webinar like Dr. Rajendran, C.P. Rajendran, a known geologist and also General Secretary of uh, Geological Society of Mizoram. Uh, sir, nice. Uh, nice. Thank you very much for attending the session, and uh, many other people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, especially, I'm very happy to be mm -hmm. after a long time, uh, and uh, yeah, people like you can be like their source of information of geology for us, uh, and uh, definitely like it's it's yeah, yeah, it's sure. it's, uh, it's a pleasure sure. to have uh, all of you here. Uh, we might have many more such events where we all can come together and speak about uh, something to share our knowledge with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Jaishri. Uh, thank you all the participants for their patience and uh, for their part active participation. Okay. And a special thanks to Dr. Jaishri for such an inf informative uh, presentation and uh, like making us celebrate uh, Geologist Day successfully. So thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you I so much. Once again, happy Geologist Day to all. Yeah, happy Geologist Day to all. And I think uh, there will be a form shared. There is a feedback form shared in the chat box. So I request all the participants to please uh, fill that. So it will help us to improve uh, whatever our efforts we are putting towards uh, research and conservation of caves and celebrating International Year of Caves and Casts and also improve uh, the way we are conducting things. 
so that will definitely help us and uh, i request all the participants please keep participating in such events and sharing your uh, doubts or sharing your information because it is very important for us to share a knowledge and uh, covid has taught us this is one of the ways to share the knowledge and sitting in different parts of the not only country different parts of the world we can share our knowledge we had some uh, we have some international participants also uh, so it's it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to have all of you thank you thank you very much i i think uh, should we end the session now dhanusha is there anything else Mm-hmm. i think i think sir we are done like okay bye we can yeah okay. <laughs> no good evening yeah thank you so much we can much. we can end the session now thank, thank you, you thank everybody. you all thank you again thanks yeah so yeah yeah and thanks a lot bye bye good night good night sirish thank you bye bye